All right, guys. The special edition of EYL broadcasted at the NFLPA house. Yes, we're in the house. Thank you guys for the hospitality. So, money. It comes with a lot of questions, and Fidelity can help you get answers. Visit fidelity.com slash black wealth to learn more we have what has been called the most important person in sports by some people uh he'll be here in a few minutes <laughs> <laughs> he'll be joining us steve warman a little bit a little coffee i don't know who that is but uh they got coffee and water when they get here he'll, he'll be joining us shortly <laughs> so, so 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 d smith the executive director of the nfl pa um first and foremost thank you for Joining us, appreciate it. Oh man, thank you for uh, th thank you for having me. I mean, this is a crazy week. Getting down to with uh, you guys, talking, having a good rap, having a good conversation. Just thanks for having me. It's it's a lot easier than a negotiation session with. The <laughs> uh, I mean, to take your time out during the biggest week of the NFL season is is very important. So we are gracious to have you. So thank you. Thanks. Yeah, so this is right up our alley. You know, we're a business platform. So a lot of people watch the Super Bowl. They're fans of, of teams, um, but they don't really know the inner workings of how the business actually gets handled. And they might have heard of the NFLPA, but I feel a lot of people don't even know what the NFLPA is. So can you just give an overview of what exactly the NFLPA is? Yeah, I mean, look, the, the NFLPA is, the, is a labor union for the active NFL players. So... You know, if you want to think about it, that Roger Goodell represents the owners, uh, I represent the good guys. <laughs> and uh, our job is to uh, negotiate, you know, we negotiate something called a collective bargaining agreement. Mm -hmm. And that is, as I explained to our guys, it's the small B, small B, not capital B, small B Bible that governs the relationship between the owners and the players. So everything with respect to how much we get paid, the work we have to do, the working conditions that we have to do it in, and the benefits, the compensation package for the players. Um, the NFLPA negotiates that for every active NFL player. So in terms of NFLPA, let's see if we can break this down. There's over 2,000 players. Correct. You represent them. Yep. There's 32 owners, and Roger Goodell represents them. Uh, hired and paid for by them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Make sure that we're clear. All right. So, in, in, in terms of collective bargaining, because there's some people who may not even understand what that is, can you talk about that? Because I know that that's, sure. that has to happen every maybe five to six, ten years, perhaps. Yeah. yeah. And look, I mean, I, I make a lot of fun of Ro with Roger because, well, it's fine. But, um, <laughs> but, but I go out of the way to do that because every now and then people think that the commissioner is somehow this guy who represents both the players and the owners and that he's neutral and he's not biased. No, I mean, he's only hired to represent the interest of the owners. So in that paradigm, that means you have to have somebody on the other side uh, that purely represents the interest of the players. And so what the union does is, I, look, I don't want to you know scare any fans out there. We're not even here to protect the game. Hmm. I'm not here to facilitate the game. I dig the game, but I'm here to represent the interest of the players. So when we sit down and we form a collective bargaining agreement, that's not there to protect the game as much as it is to be the contractual relationship between the management and the players. And if we can get the collective bargaining agreement right, then the game proceeds, mm -hmm. but not backwards. Right. Because a lot of people, you know, we talked about the combine earlier and, you know, believe me, my, my inbox is full of people like, what am I going to do without the combine? Like, first of all, read a book. Um, <laughs> but the way we look at it is if if the game is inconsistent with the best interests of the players, then there shouldn't be a game. And we make the game subject to the interest, the best interest of the players. And that's the only way it has to work, right? Because if we get that backwards, then you're perpetuating the game at the expense of the player. And for the things that, you know, I know we're going to talk about today, I don't believe that any man or woman should ever come at the expense of anything. You, you said something and, and while you were just speaking, you said you dig the game. And then you said you maybe you're not the, a football guy. You're you're. You started out as a yeah. United States attorney in, yeah. in the District of Columbia. So how did that transition go from that <laughs> to now 
the you know most important man in sports as some say. Uh, first of all, we just need to drop that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you one people. Nobody believes that in my house. So you know, nobody believes that the most important anything in my house. Um, you know, I got a call and uh, I was on the transition team for the Department of Justice uh, in two thousand and eight after uh, uh, Senator uh, um, Obama then became President Obama elect. Uh, so I was working on the transition team for the Department of, of Justice, uh, headed back to the U.S. Attorney's Office, and a search firm called and they said, "Hey, we put together a list of 300 people for uh, for the NFL players' job, and and you're one of the you know 10, 20 people who have nothing to do with sports." And I was like, "Is that a compliment?" <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, they said that you know the executive committee was interested in a wide range of candidates. And I said, well, look, I, I, you know, I'm not a labor lawyer. I'm not an antitrust lawyer. I mean, my, my practice at the time was representing really large corporations who were in really big fights. So, you know, com corporations like Halliburton, products, liability companies, uh, pharmaceutical companies. Um, that was my job, just to represent their interest um, when, when they found themselves in harm's way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the only thing that really got me interested in it was, uh, I remember the guy saying, the executive committee knows that they are in for a big fight in 2011. The league wants them to give back 20% of their salary. They want the players to give up their pensions. And they want the players to play 18 games for free. Mm -hmm. And I thought, whoa, I mean, that sounds fantastic. So, uh, I mean, other than those things, I mean, that still sounds great. Man. I'm like, where, I can do that. Where do they sign? Where do we sign? So, you know, I loved the fight part of it and uh, made a decision that I would go in this direction uh, rather than going back to government. And it's been uh, 14 beautiful, stress free years. Yeah. I mean, I had a full head of hair when I started this gig. Yeah. I was 6'2". A few unanimous elections. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you're, doing, you're doing something. All right. It's, <laughs> it's worked out. Like I say, I, I try to keep Pepto-Bismol in, in business. They're crushing it. <laughs> so, crushing it with me. So um, you talked about 2011. Mm -hmm. You talked about that. And uh, there was a strike that took place. Lockout. Lockout. Yeah. Big difference. So, you know, think about it. So a strike is when uh, workers decide that they are not going to go to work and they're going to deprive management of their their labor and their talents until management gives them what they want. Strikeout is almost the same thing, but that's management saying, no, 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 you can't come to work. Mm -hmm. So the difference is when they locked us out, they not only kicked all of the players out of work, most people don't know, but they cut off all of the players' health insurance. So, I mean, we had 12 to 15 women who were due to give birth during the lockout, and they woke up one morning and the league cut off their health insurance. And the reason the league does the lockout is, I mean, I tend to be a little blunt, so if you don't mind. No, A lockout feel free. is designed to step on your neck until you say stop. So the league cut off their salaries, cut off the health care, and it was just really simple. You're going to give up that pension and you're going to give up that 20 percent. You're going to give up, um, you know, the right to play 18 games uh, for, for compensation because we're going to try to choke you out. And their philosophy is simple. The players financially can't go long without getting paid and getting, you know, health care. And the players are going to give up. And so my job is to figure out how to how to fight that. And, and that's when we really started, at least for me, started this idea that, that if you can financially take care of your house, if you can build your house and, and keep your house and maintain your house, you can dictate your own destiny. And so, you know, we did a lot of things. We sued, you know, we sued the, the NFL because they had. They had sort of jury rigged the TV contracts to give them four billion dollars <laughs> against us. And mm -hmm. we fought that in court. And we also got a secret insurance policy that would have paid our guys around eight hundred and fifty million dollars if we would have gone the whole season. And so, you know, what did that insurance policy do? It restored our house. And then once we got there, it was like, OK, let's now negotiate a fair collective bargaining agreement. But that's the you know, that was the. <laughs> That was the landscape in 2011, and uh, I mean it was tough. Um, but man, we had great leaders, and, um, and and great leadership got us through. Well, how do you feel? Because it's like 
billionaires are always going to have more leverage than millionaires, right? So like you said, it's like the longer you drag somebody out in the water, eventually you're going to drown. Yep. So, and we've heard stories about NFL players during that time that had to take high entrance loans because they, they were living paycheck to paycheck. Um, Awful. So how do you negotiate with somebody that has tremendously more leverage than you have? Just got to do what you do. Um, you try to level the playing field the best way you can, right? So without being you know too crazy and too dorky, but that's who I am. I'm a lawyer. I just apologize. But um, you know, 2008 was right after 2009 to 2011 was right after the 2008 financial collapse. Um, a lot of the owners had debt service on on stadiums that had been built over the last five, 10 years. And if you analyze the market, you realize that they've got to make debt payments on that debt. How are they going to do that if football was shut down? Well, they did it by making the TV networks pay them $4 billion, even if the games weren't played. Mm -hmm. Well, legal strategy is we're beneficiaries of those contracts. So we argued to a judge that if the league did that, that means that the league was using the TV contracts against us. And the judge agreed. So that took their $4 billion, put it over here. We decided that we were going to do a secret insurance policy that gave our players $850 million. So that put money over. What's the secret insurance policy? Can you talk about that? Yeah. So, um, again, I, you know, I, I was a lawyer that did a lot of lawsuits and a lot of litigation, used to sue a lot of uh, <laughs> insurance companies back in the day, which was a blast. Um, <laughs> just a blast. Um, no one had ever, no one had ever developed an insurance policy to protect players if management locked you out. So we went into the market, really complicated, and uh, we placed an insurance policy where an insurance company said, if the owners keep you locked out for the entire year, we will pay the NFL players $850 million. Now that sounds like a lot of money, but our, our, Probably our player cost at the time was somewhere around three and a half to four billion dollars. So eight hundred and fifty million dollars is not going to replace, right? The the four billion dollars. That's not the idea. The idea is the owners probably thought that the players could only go three weeks, four weeks, five weeks without a paycheck. Mm -hmm. The insurance company meant the insurance company policy meant that we could go sixteen weeks. So while they were probably telling their um, their banks that we will have your money on our debt service in five weeks and we'll have the money to pay off their debts in six weeks. Once we told them that the players could go a full year, now what happens? Now the banks are saying, wait a minute, we're not going to get our money in five weeks? Well, where does that move the incentive? Now it puts a lot of incentive on the owners to get a fair deal done. Mm. So, you know, it's it's always going to be a metric where um management has more money and and management can outlast you but but what we've seen in the country lately and and, and primarily it's been through um labor unions that are primarily women what have you seen in the last three years nurses going on strike mm -hmm. right and just saying we're going to shut down all the hospitals you see teachers going on strike um and the, what i try to tell our guys is man think about it i mean our minimum salary um, right now is um, eight hundred thousand dollars, give or take. Um, eight hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Think about the teachers and the nurses um, and the, the you know. I'm going to go to a labor rally tomorrow for Starbucks workers. Those people aren't making eight hundred thousand dollars. They're living paycheck to paycheck. Mm -hmm. So when they decide to go on strike, they are literally risking everything. Mm -hmm. And, and one of the, the messages, I think, for every labor leader, including myself, is when I talk to our guys, the fact that our starting salaries are so large um, should mean that you should live within your means, right? Mm -hmm. And if you live within your means, you should be able to go on strike because you shouldn't be in a world where you're living paycheck to paycheck. And by the way, if we went on strike for a year, we'd own the NFL own it and but every player has to make that decision okay i get it d but you're telling me that i'm only going to play an average of three and a half years mm -hmm. and you're asking me to give uh one third of my earning capacity for a cba or a collective bargaining agreement that's likely going to benefit people after me after me mm -hmm. 
and 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 I'm not going to benefit from it, and somebody else who's younger than me is going to benefit it uh, from it more than me. And I simply turn to him and say, Yeah. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. That's exactly uh, what I'm asking. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> these guys are smarter than I thought. A plus huh? for the quiz. A plus. You're all fat. So, what happens in a situation like that when there's a decision that has to be made? For a hypothetical example, NFL wants to go to 17 games. Yep. Usually, it's a 16 game season. Yep. The owners obviously want to do it because it makes sense. There's yep. more games, they make more money. Yep. People understand concessions, all that. Players have to look at it from a health standpoint like, yo, we're risking our bodies for another yep. week. Right now, and, and a financial standpoint, and a financial standpoint, right, right. So now, does that go to the teams, and is it like, is it a fifty percent vote, or is there like a, how how does that work? Well, this time it went to all of player, uh, all of player membership. Okay. Um. So you know, back in twenty eleven, I mean, again, you know, I hate to be a dorky lawyer, but you know, up to uh, you guys are a little young, so you don't remember, <laughs> but there was actually a time when there were twelve games in the NFL, twelve. I, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't think I've ever been a part of it. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you right now, you weren't. What were you? Uh, what uh, uh, probably the seventies, right? Just pump the brakes, man. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, like, why do you go right to the seventies? Like, okay, he wasn't there. Yes, I was there in the seventies. <laughs> yeah, let's just let's just step on it a little bit. Yeah, so we went from twelve games to fourteen games, mm-hmm. then to sixteen games, and that was an arc between the uh, I'm sorry, late seventies all the way through the the nineties. The league had the unilateral right to go up to 20 games. So think about it. Historically, we went from 12 games to 14 games. Never changed the player's share of revenue. We went from 14 games to 16 games. More work, same share of revenue. We Players never got paid technically more when we increased those games. So when I got here in 2009... And, and we were negotiating the deal in, in 2011. I mean, look, the first thing that I'm looking at from a from a from an economic standpoint is, if I can increase your work and not increase your pay, that's a problem. It's a big problem. So we changed it in 2011, where the league could only increase the games if the players agreed to it. Hmm. So fast forward to 2011. Uh, 2020. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're doing the deal. The players uh, negotiated a, a, a deal where every player making minimum got a 20% raise. Former players' pensions went up. All the benefits went up. The package went up. We we gained uh, a larger share of, of our revenue. So to put it in perspective, um, the league bought a 17th game in 2020 for approximately one Point five to one point six billion dollars that they had for free in twenty eleven. And, and who, who? How does this voting process take place? Every single player votes, and then it's the majority wins. Correct. So, so they get when, ballots, and they have to. Yeah, yeah. This this one, and look, I, I understand that it was a difficult decision for the players, but you know, my job is. And by the way, I don't get a vote. Um, you know, the players wanted X, Y, and Z, and including increases. The league conditioned all of those increases on a game, on an extra game. And then, you know, for me, my job is to get the the best deal on the table. But I remind our players, look, I don't play. So you vote. Vote. And and yeah, it was split and, and most of the players were on one side. And it, was it was close. It was close. Yeah. I think it was 62 votes yeah. out of nearly 1,500 votes cast. Yeah. But that's democracy. And and so you know, look. I mean, are are we benefiting from it? Yes, we had the largest uh, salary cap jump uh, in the history of of uh, of the sport. Um, we got through COVID. We're we're going through a recession. <clears throat> we were on the eve of the biggest game of the year. And I mean, think about it. I mean, every year we are eighty five of the top hundred shows on television, mm-hmm. and that's regardless of a recession. That's regardless of COVID. I love the fact that, you know, NFL players are the highest paid players um, in the country by sport. I love the fact that we've got a pension uh, and benefits, you know, package that that is, you know, on top of the cap, some 50, 60 million dollars a year. Um, but that comes with a decision from leadership and, and my job. And, and I refuse to, to do anything that takes the leadership weight mm-hmm. off of our guys. 
make a decision. When you say the highest paid by sport, because for mine, I thought it was baseball number one, basketball number two, and then football number three. No, it's not. I mean, again, um, I mean, I always have this conversation with players in a locker room. It's like, well, how come we don't get paid as much money as basketball players? I'm like, well, hey, that's great. You know how many basketball players are in the country? 450. Five, 500. Let's just make the math easy. 500. You want me to quadruple your salary? We go from 1,800 players to 500 players. Mm. Now, if we did that... So, based on the amount of players, okay. Right. So, so based on the amount of players. Yeah. So, make. I look at it as how much money is coming in versus how many players are playing. So, our annual revenue this year will probably exceed... 18 billion dollars going to all of our players um next up is going to be you know basketball then baseball their average revenue uh their all revenue this year will probably be somewhere around 12 billion dollars but their 12 billion dollars is split by 450 uh players our 18 billion is split between 1800 players okay so you know I can only look at aggregate amounts of money coming in. If if NFL players want to increase salaries and they want to do two a days, like you know, two way players, like I did when I was in high school, uh, I was terrible, by the way. <laughs> um, For the record, absolutely terrible. Yeah, man, I you know I could figure out the game, but you know, that's whole getting hit thing was like. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, think about it. If we if we dropped from two thousand players to 1,000 players, the average salary of the players would double. Yeah. So, you know, I think every now and then people see sort of the, the, the individual amount that a person is playing, but you're looking at a sport where you've got 2,000 people, you know, in one place, 450 people in another, and I think roughly what, 500, maybe 550 baseball players on the other side. So a much smaller pool of people I, I guess why it feels that way is that when we look at sports contracts and this is maybe something i guess you can talk about in collective bargaining is that those sports have guaranteed contracts uh, and careful well <laughs> careful some of them careful no no you're absolutely right oh. and, and, and the reason why i i like to have this conversation yeah which sport which sports cba guarantees contracts nba I'm not sure. It sounds like a trick. That sounds like a trick. Sounds like she was like, let him go first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want. Yeah. Uh, the answer is no one's. Okay. Nobody's collective bargaining agreement guarantees contracts. And okay. and again, you know, I'm a I'm a little bit of a history nerd. So you know, everybody believes that basketball contracts, all of them are 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 guaranteed by their collective bargaining agreement, or baseball's contracts. Or guaranteed by collective bargaining agreement. The, the fact is, none of them. So about five years ago, I mean, it probably took me a year to do the research. Um, I wanted to find out, well, wait a minute. If their CBAs don't guarantee the contracts, why are more NBA contracts guaranteed than NFL contracts? So if you go back in history, you take a look. There was a two a two year story. Um, again, you're probably too young to remember Moses Malone. You no, we know. We know. No, no, you remember not, historically, 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 historically. Historically. I was born when they never saw him play, but I remember yeah. him. I know, I know I who he is. I an all-star game for sure. <laughs> when he was five. When he was 95 years old. I was born in <laughs> 82, for the record. So he won. <laughs> right? Like, yeah, the six is one in yeah, yeah, yeah. I graduated from high school in 81. So, yeah, man. Yeah, it's hilarious. Um, anyway. I went back in history to take a look at that. So Moses Malone, uh, when he renegotiated his contract, um, he broke the bank. And he had the largest contract in NBA history. The next year, Larry Bird comes up to renegotiate his contract. Larry Bird says, I want more money than Moses Malone. Celtics go, mm, no. Larry Bird says, okay. I looked at Moses Malone's contract and I noticed that he had a base salary of X. He got a bonus if he got Y, if he became MVP. He got a bonus if they won uh, the world championship. He got a bonus if he sold a certain amount of um, apparel. Larry Bird's agent, Bob Wolf, came back and said, we want the same money as Moses Malone, but we don't want any incentives tied to it. 
So Larry Bird's contract in basketball became the first contract where it was fully guaranteed. No incentives, no nothing. Mm -hmm. And so from that point forward, every major um, uh, free agent had their contract structured like Larry Bird's contract. That's how they got guaranteed contracts in, in basketball, not by their CBA, but by custom. So you fast forward to the NFL. Kirk Cousins gets franchised twice. Yes. Those are fully guaranteed contracts by the CBA mm -hmm. that we wrote. Then what does he do? He goes into the market and he says, my last two contracts were fully guaranteed. Yeah. I'm going to go into the market and I want a fully guaranteed, guaranteed contract. And he got franchise tag twice for context. And you can't franchise a tag somebody three times. Correct. And so he had to get... He had to go to the free market. free market, but even in that franchise, he had to make the average of the top five quarterbacks. Average of the top five the first time, average of the top three the second time, plus 120%, plus right? So then he goes into the free market, but there's nothing in the free market by the CBA that says that his contract has to be fully guaranteed. Right. He went into the market demanding a fully guaranteed contract because he had the leverage. But here's what happens. After he does his contract, how many quarterbacks do contracts after Kirk Cousins? Russell. You got what? Oh, you got yeah. Tom Brady, you got Drew Brees, you got Peyton Manning, Patrick Mahomes, all of them. Did they get their contracts fully guaranteed? No. No. So what happened in basketball didn't happen in football. Why? I don't know. Is that the agent's fault? I don't know. <laughs> because I don't get to negotiate their contracts, right? Yeah. So but so my, when I teach on guaranteed contracts, I teach the Moses Malone to Larry Bird to free agent movement of guaranteed contracts. Then you come back and you teach the fully guaranteed franchise tag yeah. under Kirk Cousins goes to the free market, fully guaranteed contracts. Then so, it doesn't happen. So you're giving them the education. What they choose to do with the education, I can't end up, up to them. negotiate their contract. It's up to them. And then you fast forward for for whatever you know for whatever people want to think. I I don't care what most people think, but um, Deshaun Watson negotiates a fully guaranteed fully guaranteed contracts. What quarterbacks do contracts after Deshaun Watson? We got some. Doesn't really matter. Yeah. Are they fully guaranteed? No. So once again, the cycle happens. What should have happened in the market right. uh, was what should have happened with Larry Bird, but it doesn't happen in football. So now we're on the cusp of what I consider to be one of the most dynamic quarterbacks in NFL history mm -hmm. is coming up on the end of his rookie deal. Yeah. And he's about to hit the free market. And one of two things will happen if the owner decides we don't want you to go to the free market. Lamar Jackson will be yeah. franchised. Right. You'll get the average of the top five quarterbacks, and that's fully guaranteed. Mm -hmm. Great. If he gets franchised a second time, he gets the average of the top three plus 120%. Great. But, but if he wants to do a free market contract, wouldn't it be in his best interest to get the same type of contract that Deshaun Watson got? Kirk Cousins got and Larry Bird got. Before we leave, how do you feel about the combine? You spoke about <laughs> it. You want to elaborate about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, and, and look, I'm, I'm, you know, as we talked about, I'm not a football guy, and, and frankly, I don't think I'm supposed to be. Um, I, I deal in contracts and scintillating things like regression analysis and looking at data and trends and TV contracts and all of these things. So I, I don't look at this, and I don't think any labor leader should look at a job like this as how do we preserve the game? Mm -hmm. I represent a group of workers who have really short careers and I want to maximize their return on football. I want them to get more out of football than football gets out of them. So when I look at the combine, instead of thinking about it like football, I think about it like work. Okay. I went to a, I went to a top 10 law school. I mean, I did okay. I can't imagine a world where all of my fellow students from all of the other top 10 law schools, do extremely well in, in law school. We're rated some of the best potential lawyers in the country. Mm -hmm. 
we take the bar and we pass the bar and the bar says you d and all of the hundreds of other law school students are, are are poised to be the best lawyers in the world but instead of you picking your law firm here's what we're going to do the bar is decided that instead of you picking your law firm all of you are going to go to a certain city and instead of i know we passed the bar and i know you've already graduated from law school and all that's great but here's what we're going to do for three days we're going to give you a bunch of law quizzes and all of you are going to take a bunch of quizzes and we're going to see how well you do on the law quiz oh and by the way because everybody who comes to our law firm has health care, we're going to put you through medical testing to see if you are genetically predisposed for liver disease or cancer, or if, if, if you're a woman, you might want to take maternity leave one day. And we're going to factor all that in because that impacts our health care cost. And after that, we will decide whether you can become a lawyer. If that happened in law or journalism or doctors or anywhere else, people would go, have you lost your mind? What are we doing? You should just take me as a potential employee mm -hmm. based on how well I did in school. Have I passed the test? Can I do the work? Yes. The combine is the only place I know of where we now know, especially you guys who are younger than me, thanks for pointing it out. <laughs> um, you've seen, if I asked you right now um, to look at the top five prospective draft picks, mm -hmm. and I said, hey man, can you pull up on your phone how fast they run, how high they can jump, and give me a rundown of their physical skills for football? You could pull all that up on your phone right now, and you probably would have what? 20 NFL uh, junior videos. Everything from the guy running from the time he was in junior high school until college. Yep. You've got it. Yep. So here's what I know. Do we know how fast these guys can run? Yes. All right. We know how high they can jump. We know how much they can lift. If, if scouts want to know exactly how that happens and they want another second check, what do they do? They can go to the schools and do pro days. Right? Yet... We set up this invitation-only combine where you have to be invited. And then when you show up, you have to sign a medical waiver. And they put you through the MRI machine. You get interviewed by 32 team doctors, 32 separate doctors. Then a GM sits down with you and says, hey, I want to talk to you about your childhood. What does your mother do? What does your father do? Did you grow up in a violent culture? How were you in high school? What kind of friends did you do to hang around? All I'm saying is, why would we accept a system like that in football? And we would never accept a system like that outside of football. And so when I talk about the combine, I look at it as not a football thing. It's a worker thing. And is there a way of conducting an interview that doesn't infringe on your privacy and your medical history? Because let's not get it twisted for a second. Why are you being evaluated by a doctor? Why are you being put through an MRI? Right before you sign your first NFL contract, you have to have a physical. Yep. The physical is designed so that the doctor knows that you are physically capable of doing the work. If that happens at the end, what is this medical evaluation at the beginning? It's to decrease your draft stock, right? Mm -hmm. I got two linebackers. Both of you are 6'3", 240. Both of you run a 4'4", 40. Both of you can bench big time weight. You can do your squats. Both of you have a vertical lift of blah, blah, blah. How do I draw the difference between whether I'm gonna pick you or you? You wanna know Man, did that guy, does that guy have a sign of a knee injury from high school? Does his shoulder have any sort of degenerative tissue? What's on his x-ray? What's on his MRI? Well, I, they both run the same thing, but what, which one is more likely to be injured? That is only there for one reason. To drop you from the third pick of the draft to the fifth pick of the draft, from the first round of the draft to the third round of the draft. And here's my problem with it. 
the combine is structured so that you can't say no. So I asked myself the question, would I want that system for my daughter? Would you want that system for your son? No. And I find it medically, professionally, and ethically intrusive. That's my thing about the combine. And apparently I've made tons of friends by saying <laughs> So yeah, my picture is on the wall at the Indianapolis airport now with like a big slash to it. So not welcome. Uh no. Uh, no. But that's okay. My job's not about making friends. Thank you for your time, brother. Man, appreciate great. it. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Had a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you. My graduates from my school being Forbes. Backdrop. Backdrop. <laughs> a mic drop. Backdrop. Backdrop. <laughs>